you mentioned in your opening remarks that there is now so much great television. Uh, why is that? Um, so I have a theory of what we're going through with television at the moment, which is that for the first time, certainly in my time in the entertainment business, which has been for over 20 years now, technology has actually affected storytelling and has done it in a way that, again, uh, like with most technology, you have the law of unintended consequences. And so let me give you by background what I mean by that. So back in the late 70s, the Casio company came out with the first digital watch. And I remember I got very excited in the late 90s when the internet came on the scene and I ha was having lunch at the time with a friend of mine, Milton Glaser, a well-known graphic designer who at that point was in his early 70s. And I was predicting all sorts of ways that the internet would change our life, all of which proved to be wrong. And he said to me, you have no idea how this technology would play out. And he pointed to me out to me the instance of the Casio watch. And what he said was, look around this restaurant. How many people here do you see that have a digital face on their watch? Because at the time in the late 70s, everybody predicted we were, would be telling time digitally. This is before you all had uh, cell phones and now do that. And sure enough, everybody in the, in the restaurant had an analog watch on. And what he said was, I dare say everybody, every one of those watches or most of them have a quartz mechanism. But the reason they have an analog face is because the engineers didn't understand how people tell time. People are not interested in what time it is, but rather how much time they have left. They look at the minute hand and try and see when, when it is they have to leave for something. And how that relates to television is this. When DVRs and catch-up uh, television and SVOD services came into our lives five or six years ago, well, actually, DVRs have been around for longer than that, um, more than 10 years now. The thinking was that they were really going to time shift viewing. They were going to allow us to watch television when we wanted to watch it as opposed to linear programming. And that indeed has happened. But something else has happened, which is that it has permitted um, open-ended episodic drama. Um, so prior, in 10, 15 years ago, or even, even as late as eight years, early as eight years ago, um, almost all dramatic television in the United States and in and Britain for that matter, you had to finish the plot of a, of a television show within the one hour allotted. Because the f worry was if you didn't do that, you would, the, 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 the viewer, having missed an episode in a series, would abandon the series because they couldn't keep up. And there were a few isolated examples of television shows that were open-ended, like The Wire and The Sopranos and 24. But for the most part, networks didn't want to risk that. Along comes, along comes the DVR, and all of a sudden, you can watch. I don't know what that is. All, along comes the DVR, and all of a sudden, you can watch an episode um, whenever you want to watch it. And this enabled us, for the first time in the entertainment business, to start producing television shows that have open-ended episodes, meaning you can actually evolve characters over the course of eight and 10 and 12 <coughs> episodes, hours of television. You get things like Breaking Bad and Mad Men. You get Don Draper going from being you know, a suburban husband to becoming some yoga-posing hippie, or Walter White going from being a perfectly nice guy to being an evil drug lord. And the writers loved it. The writers said, in many ways, this is a better way to tell a story than a movie. And they flocked to television. They flocked to it. And with great writing comes great directing. And with great directing comes really good actors. And the next thing you know, you have the golden age of television. And so now what you see is hundreds and hundreds of series coming on the air of dramatic television, which really, I think, is the result of this very fundamental shift in, 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 these, in these technologies that have come into our lives. And um, we're only now trying to understand what this will all mean, how long these SVOD services will be around, how many of them there will be. But it's, to me, that's really why we have this in incredible period in television. So I, mean, I, I was going to ask, how do you, you know, after so many years in the entertainment industry, how do you continue to find enjoyment and be engaged in new scripts and whatnot? Scripts come across your desk, but new productions that come across your desk. But it sounds like you, 
is that excitement of not knowing what's going to happen that keeps you engaged? Um, what keeps me engaged is I, and it's by the way not all all the time at our own, not always at Sony is 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 every now and again you look up and you see something extraordinary happening. You see uh, a movie or a television show that completely breaks the mold and you you suddenly realize that this is an, an th that that this is a business of invention and creativity like very few others around today and 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 that's what gets you going. You know, I I, I the 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 average action movie or the average procedural uh, drama, I can't honestly tell you that's what keeps me in the business, but this other stuff is what gets you excited every day. And you know, you spoke about how the industry is changing because of the different methods, um, the technology. Um, right. Or with something like... Well, the creative process has changed. Right, the creative yeah. process. And with something like Netflix, where you know you get series like House of Cards or Orange is the New Black, where all the episodes come out at exactly the same time, Right. Um, that changes the creative process as well, I would imagine. But does that, with Sony not producing shows like that, does that have an impact on Sony's creative process? No, actually we do. So it's interesting how Netflix, we were sort of part of that process. So we co-produced House of Cards. Right. The reason why I think Netflix came to the understanding of doing something all at once was uh, when we also um, produced ba Breaking Bad. When Breaking Bad first came out on linear television, the first season it was a failure. Nobody watched it on AMC, which is the network that was showing it in, Amer in America. And then Netflix picked it up to, to show the reruns um, in that summer period. And people started um, binge viewing, eight hours of it all at once. And they realized people are willing to lose an entire weekend or certainly a night's sleep to watching a television show or an eight-hour movie. And what happened the following season is that the audience had broadened out enormously and people flocked to the television show by the second, by the second season. But Netflix also saw this very important thing called binge viewing now, which I sort of distinguish between binge viewing and tantric viewing, which is the way traditionally we grew up watching episodic television, you know, once a week. Um, and it's a, it's a very different way of making a television show because um, you're really almost making, as I said, a 10-hour film. And right now, we're making um, uh, two shows for uh, Netflix. One of them is with Baz Luhrmann called The Get Down, which is the history of, uh, it's a show about how hip-hop was born in the, in the Bronx in the late 70s. And the other one is here in the UK. Um, that Peter Morgan has written. It's, he's written already uh, 20 hours of it, and it's based on the play The Audience, um, which is called The Crown, and it basically will track the history of Queen Elizabeth, starting with Winston Churchill and her interviews or her daily, weekly interviews with prime ministers, starting with Winston Churchill, working up through the present day. And, um, you know, he writes these things almost like a film because you're tracking, you know, 10 hours of, per year of, of what the audience is going to see. And, they'll s and they will get it all at once in, in the fall. And do you binge watch yourself? No. I did it. I did it. I lost three months of my life, I will admit. <laughs> I did it to The Wire. I, I watched all five years of The Wire in a three-month period with my wife. We restricted ourselves to four hours a night. It <laughs> took us three months to get through it. How, how uh, restrained of you? It, well, well, we had no social life. <laughs> Our children didn't see us. I have three daughters. Um, and at the end of the three months, we promised each other we would never do that again. <laughs> that this was not a healthy way to lead our life. Not even for House of Cards? Uh, not even for House of Cards, no, not oh. even for House of Cards. Blasphemy. Um, <laughs> what can I tell you? Um, on a separate note, can you explain a bit about what windowing is? Right. So windowing has grew up organically in the film business um, as a way of creating um, different opportunities for the public to see and pay for movies. So obviously the first way that a movie comes out is in theaters. That's the first window. Um, the second window, uh, which uh, uh, was created, which exists, it didn't necessarily organically grow up in this way, but the second window is 
the home entertainment window, which typically comes 90 days after, and you can either download it or buy it in a DVD. And then after that, about six months later, further on, depending on which country you're on in, it goes into the pay television window. So you either see it on Sky or in the United States, HBO. And then it goes to a public broadcaster about a year later. And the benefit to the film business is that in each one of these windows, we have a different pricing scheme and a different ability to show the movie to an audience. The problem has been that the audience really doesn't recognize the windowing structure. And in the same way that there used to be a time where stores were closed on Sundays, um, but that's not the case any longer and people expect to get everything 24-7 all the time, people want movies now when they want to see them. And so this notion that you can keep it in theaters for a prescribed period and then pull it off the shelf for 90 days and then bring it back out in DVD, I think that's an idea that the audience no longer respects and it results in a lot of piracy. And while we don't want to destroy the windowing process because the problem will be if you offer it in the home at the same time as you offer it in a theater, you may actually cause people not to go to theaters any longer. We do have this we have this discrepancy going on in the audience's mind. They really don't understand why we window. And they, as a result, I think a lot of stealing goes on. And it sounds like you think DVDs won't be around for that much longer. Well, I don't think DVDs will be around for that much longer, but that, the difference between you know, buying something on iTunes and a DVD is, uh, I, you know, a, a digital file to me is the same as a DVD. Right, and, and how, with windowing, how does that affect the music industry as opposed to the film industry? So the music industry has never used windowing. Right. The music industry, the, uh, except to the extent to which they, the way they would launch an album uh, and still do to an extent is to say, okay, let's start with a single track, let's, which we think is the most commercial. We'll play that track heavily, get people hooked on the song. Then we find another track, play that track. And then finally, we, you know, once you get two or three out there, then you release the album. What's happened now is that the, so the music industry has gone through these three major shifts. The first was, um, you know, the CD, which had the, had the misfortune of uh, coming out before PCs came out. So what that meant was CDs were always unencrypted. So the minute the internet showed up, you had a terrible problem with piracy. So the industry collapsed. Then obviously you had digital downloading and now that's going away in favor of streaming. So people are giving up ownership for access. The only way I think that the music industry is really gonna survive is if the streaming model um, follows a subscription business, like Spotify, for example. And, the, w and the, 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 the only way I think that Spotify and these other services can get off the free piece is by windowing. So that's the long way of saying when we now release a new track, we are going to window it in all likelihood and say, fine, for a two-week period, you will only be able to listen to the next song by so-and-so if you're a subscriber to Spotify or if you're a subscriber to Apple Music. And in fact, in the case of Adele, um, we only, re we just, you, you, had to buy the, you had to buy the full album. It wasn't even available on a streaming service. So she, she chose to window that, the, the thing right out of the gate. And it's very much still the artist's decision. Um, it's pretty much of a joint decision. I mean, technically, the 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 music company has the 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 veto right or the the ability to determine w how the what the distribution pattern is. But you know, if you're Adele, you get to decide. <laughs> and yeah, I said we'd jump around a few different topics. Yeah, yeah. If, if we lightly touch on on the hack, it, it seems to be all that everyone really talks about when it comes to Sony even a year on. Um, it certainly seems to be the most prominent thing even now. How do you try and shift the conversation away from that? Do you try and shift the conversation away from that? Yeah, because it's, you know, it's, 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 uh, it's, it's unpleasant business. I think if you go even into, ho if you, certainly at ho in Hollywood these days and certainly on, at the studio, the hack is very much in the rear view mirror. Um, I think where it comes up is uh, mostly, it comes up in two different ways from in my personal experience. One is when I meet somebody else who's 
not necessarily in the entertainment business, but in business in general, and their company has just been hacked. And I get, gosh, I must get half a dozen calls a week at this point. And they say, what do, you, what do I do? You know, what, what is the playbook of how I deal with this? Not hacked at the level at which we were hacked, but you know, information was stolen or employee data has been exposed. to The second, as I said, is I'm stunned, I guess people have a lot of free time, at the number of people who will casually walk up to me and say, wow, I just read that, you know, you and so-and-so have an active correspondence about, I don't know, playing tennis or why did you say this about me to so-and-so? And I'm thinking to myself, really? You, you've just poured through all of my email to do that? But um, that still goes on. That still goes on. And one of the things that you spoke about at the time is something that you never really expected when you entered the entertainment industry to be dealing with politics and in, in the political sphere. Right. How, from a management and leadership perspective, how do you adapt from being a leader in the entertainment industry to, as many people are saying, flying the flag for the First Amendment? Well, we got ourselves, it became a First Amendment issue um, in a very, in a, in a very uh, sort of convoluted and complicated way because it was through a series of miscommunications and misunderstandings. Um, when at the very end, we, the, when we were hacked, there was a series of threatening emails that were coming to us progressively and nobody could identify who those emails were coming from. And then the Wednesday before the movie was actually released, um, on the, I guess it was the 23rd of December, there was an email that was sent to um, the national movie theater chains in the United States that said, if you show this movie, we are gonna do all these terrible things. If you'll remember, we're gonna mm -hmm. blow these things up and we're gonna hurt people. And the, and the movie chains at that point uh, <coughs> determined that they couldn't show the movie, except for some very small independents. And we came to the conclusion that without the movie theaters, we couldn't distribute the movie and we would have to sort of recalibrate and try and understand how it was that we could get the movie out nationally. And we started making phone calls and we tried to get to a lot of big distributors of uh, uh, who, you know, the, the big e-commerce sites and the larger cable companies and satellite companies. And nobody other than Google actually really wanted to touch the movie because they had seen what had happened to us and they were worried that in that period it would become, they too would get hacked. So this all happened on the Wednesday. On the Thursday night, um, I chose to fly from LA to New York overnight to go on CNN and talk briefly about the hack to try and take some of the attention away from Amy Pascal, who um, was running the movie studio, and she had had a bunch of inflammatory emails that were exposed. And when I was waiting in the green room uh, for Fareed Zakaria, he said, let's see what the president has to say. And at that point, the president chose to um, be critical of Sony for having not shown the movie. And Freed Sakaria turns to me and says, either you can not do the interview or if you're gonna do the interview, you have to address what the president just said. And that's when it turned really into a First Amendment issue where I had to speak for an hour pretty much on live television and talk about why, why we wanted to show the movie, why we couldn't show the movie, but why we were still determined to show the movie. And, we did wind up getting it out on the day that the movie was originally meant to come out, and we did it in partnership with Google and Microsoft, and they were incredibly helpful in the process. And then everybody else subsequently came on board. And you've spoken briefly about how your style has changed, your process has changed, and you fax much more now compared to I do, before. yeah. Yeah, you, you do. Um, <coughs> and also, you were known as a, a great delegator um, before the hack in terms of management and leadership style. Are you still a great delegator or do you like everything to be much more centralized now? No, I still delegate. I would say that um, having this, I've been through a bunch of crises in my business life. Um, a terrible case of financial fraud when I was at Penguin and a couple of other bad. This is the worst. I will say when it comes, when you're in crisis, you can't delegate. When it comes to crisis, everything has to come onto one person's desk because every decision um, has an enormous ripple effects and, um, and you're constantly having to make decisions and half of the decisions you're making are wrong anyway, but you wanna make sure that you're the person making the decisions. So I would distinguish between 
delegating in sort of the normal course of business and delegating in a, in a crisis. In a crisis, I would never delegate. That, that always, in my opinion, is a mistake. And final couple of questions from me before we open it out. Uh, so a lighter topic. Yeah. Snapchat. Yeah. Um, so how did you first get involved with Snapchat? Uh, through my kids. Uh, it started on the, about five years ago, it started on the west side of LA. We live on the west side of LA. Um, and uh, the kids were using it. And it was about, there were about 25,000 people on the service at the time. And uh, um, my wife uh, loved the idea of it, not for financial reasons, but she just said, oh, wow, finally something that's not permanent on the internet that's going to ruin my kids' lives. And she looked up the terms and conditions of signing up for the service. This is my wife. Oh, nobody else would ever do this. <laughs> and uh, when one of the kids was, and found out that the person who was starting it lived right there, in, right near us. And one of my daughters raised her hand and said, oh, yeah, he's the brother of somebody I go to school with. So uh, Jamie, my wife being Jamie, invited him over. And he, uh, she said, how can we be helpful? And he said, well, we've run out of money. We're six kids <laughs> living in my dad's house, and we need a little bit of money to tide us over. And you know, she surprisingly helped him out financially. And that's how you know, it all sort of came to my attention in the first place. And, and now it's grown, obviously. Yes. Now it's become a much bigger deal. Qu quite, quite substantially. And, and what's your relationship with it now then? Do you get involved with it at all? I sit on the board. I sit on the board. What happened then was that Evan um, had to go and get uh, a lot of money. And so uh, he had to bring in a VC. And at the time that he brought in a VC, um, it was... Uh, they, dem they needed a board, and so he formed a little board. I sit on the board. There's four or five other people, and, and uh, so my involvement is that. And, you know, it's, 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 it's very helpful to me because it gives me an insight into how people are using the phone, and um, I think it's, it's one of those things that really has changed how people use the phone and the camera in particular. I think what what um, uh, Evan articulates about Snapchat probably best is not the fact that the pictures evaporate, but rather that for 150 years, going back to the example that I gave in the conversation here, or 140 years, the, the, the camera, including Instagram, by the way, was really used for documentation. And Snapchat is one of the first instances where we use it for communication. The fact that it disappears means that you can, and, and that was what was so appealing when Evan described it at our dining room table, it means that you don't have the sense of, I don't know, formality about sending something. You know, when you send a picture on the internet, you want to make sure it looks beautiful, and it's, in, with Snapchat, you, it's like a conversation. We're having a conversation, the words disappear, hopefully, you know, I mean, they're being recorded, but in the normal course of things, it disappears, and that gives a fluidity to it that doesn't exist normally with photography. And um, I think it's, it's proven to be very powerful. And really, really importantly, what's your favorite face filter thing to use? <laughs> oh, I don't use one of those. I, I've never used those, but I, yeah, I get them from my kids every now and again. I find them a little weird. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Um, but anyway, thank you very much. We'll now open up to the floor. If you have a question, please raise your hand high in the air. Wait for a microphone to come round to you. It will not amplify your voice. It is for the recording. If we could please come down here to the front in the suit. Hello. So my question is, uh, recently the Murdochs came and they, they said sort of, we're not going to share any more content with Netflix. Uh, in due course of time, do you see the entire content, television content model becoming three or four apps where every channel or studio has an app and they are producing their own content? And we just go back to the entire way broadcasting used to work, where there are a couple of channels. Just that here, we will choose when to watch, what to watch, and uh, do you see the entire Netflix model slowly of a platform where different studios come and share content going down? No. I, I, I think, you know, uh, consumers are only able to go to a certain number of sites or applications, and I think aggregation will always prove out. I, I accept the fact that Fox may want, not want to sell to Netflix and others might and actually Netflix has said that's what provokes them to create original content, that they don't necessarily want to do that. They do it because they can't get access to enough 
catalog product. But I don't think we or, or any of the other major studios would go out there and just create our own um, application. I think uh, quite the contrary. I think we'll continue to sell to Netflix and others, third-party distributors. Thank you for your question. We've got another question now, please. Um, can we go to in the shirt there? Yeah. Hi. What advice would you give for an aspiring filmmaker? Oh. Um, if somebody in the audience could tell you better than me. I think, given how much easier it is to make a movie today than it was certainly 25 years ago, r make a movie. Uh, you know, I think you should scrounge together the money you can scrounge, whether it's $10,000, 20,000 pounds, whatever the number is. You don't, you know, it, it, it was a lot more complicated, um, as you're well aware, uh, 15, 20 years ago to make a movie than it is today. And make a movie and, um, and show it to somebody who uh, then has some influence and that'll get you started. I, I can't think of a better way. The only other way that I can think of, which unless you are, I mean this happens very rarely, is you write the greatest script of all time and then you say to somebody who wants to buy the script, you'll only sell it if you can direct it. But I warn you, it better be the greatest script of all time because nobody is going to be foolish enough to do that. Thank you for your question. We've got another question now, please. Um, could please go to two in from the right there. You're wearing something grey. Other than that, I cannot distinguish anything. Thank you. Um, I was just curious how you reconcile the Sony hack um, and the exploitation, in a way, of some of your people under contract with the, the need to also publicize your films, your I mean, your products um, and the value from prop like propaganda, news sources, entertainment, news, um, and how you view kind of the, the hacking side alongside the free advertising and publicity, because it seems like yeah, a Yeah, that's line. a good, um, you're right. It's, uh, we created a little bit of our own mess. You know, the, our, the film industry, more so than the television business even, um, has has prospered and has built up this publicity machine. And a lot of the reason why these emails got the attention that they did was because they involved celebrities and we live in a culture of celebrity. Um, and um, so I would say two things. Well, first, I said the first part, which is I think it's wrong to pour through people's emails, whether they're about celebrities or not. But I, 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 I'd, I'd say something else, which is if this same thing had happened to Tesco um, in this country, it would not, I dare say, have had the kind of attention that it did. So my hope is that because it did get this kind of attention, that we all learn a lesson from it. Because uh, let's take some benefit from the fact that it happened to a movie studio and that the emails were at, for, at some level salacious and therefore got a lot of publicity and that we do know now what the real dangers are about cybersecurity. We do know now what the real issues surrounding privacy are and how we are all subject to having our lives exposed. And if anything, we were the canary in the coal mine. And given the fact that we're not the size of a company like Tesco or we're not the national grid, um, it was a relatively inexpensive cost to the economy or society at, at whole, a great cost to me and my colleagues, but I would hope that at that cost uh, we've all learned a really, really good lesson. I, I can't say, by the way, given the kinds of emails I still get, people have changed even inside of our company their email habits, but I think there's a lot of other things we couldn't have learned. Thank you for your question. Um, can we please come? Can Down. I just ask one question from... Oh, Nick? right. Well, sure. Hi, Michael. Um, I was just wondering if you could talk about your relationship with the Japanese uh, parent company and how you find doing uh, business in a very different... Um, uh, in the Japanese business culture and also how autonomous you were in a time of crisis, whether, you know, how 
obviously it was very specific to uh, North America and to the entertainment business, the, the hack, so just the interaction with the parent company. Well, two different questions. So I think um, in terms of my interactions with my Japanese parent is we, you know, I, I, I've worked for the company for 14 years. I have a very strong relationship with my boss who is Japanese but speaks English fluently. Um, I would say that the company as a whole and the way it interacts with the entertainment companies is very process driven. Um, uh, my boss actually comes out of the music business, so he has a good understanding of the entertainment business. But overall, I think it's, 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 it's much more about um, budgeting and um, strategy than it is about specific content. When it came to the hack, um, it, it was complicated by two factors. We were talking about this earlier in the day. Um, I think um, the, f uh, the, the, the first is that the, the Japanese have a very different relationship with North Korea than the United States does. To, for Japan, North Korea is a clear and present danger. It's right there. They've kidnapped people off the street of Tokyo. Um, and they potentially could do some real harm um, that's greater than that. Um, and the United States doesn't view North Korea in that way. And then the second issue is that the First Amendment is viewed very differently in Japan, or doesn't exist really in Japan, the way it does in the United States, or here for that matter. So this notion of the need to get the movie out, <coughs> because otherwise it would demonstrate censorship, is not a concept that is really part of, 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 of Japanese media culture. And so, when, when we were in the thick of the hack, we, we actually acted completely independently from the, our parent, in large part because there is that divide between the way that Japan viewed this incident and the way that we as an American entertainment company had to view the incident, if that makes sense. Thank you for your question. Um, if please come down here to the gentleman's suit. So do you agree with Spielberg's prediction about the downturn of the mega-budget uh, blockbusters, the sequel and franchise movie industry? And if so, uh, what would Sony's game plan be in that eventuality? I mean, he might be right. I, I, I don't see any evidence of it. I mean, it just, the, 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 the budgets of the movies seem to be getting bigger and the sequels seem to be getting more. I mean, I don't know what number we are up to in Fast and Furious, but there's a lot of Roman numerals after it, and they each of them are bigger than the next. So, I, I you know, I, I'm sure that at a, some point everybody will get tired of comic book characters, and at some point everybody will may get tired of Fast and Furious. But I think there's a there's a long life still in these big big franchise movies. I do think, by the same token, that um, that uh, m movies. That, 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 the, that the audience, you want to stay ahead of the audience always. You never want the audience to know what it is that they're going to see before they see it because then they really do become bored and won't come and see it. So it's Hollywood's job, or rather the creative community's job, to come up with that. And oftentimes that is not a big blockbuster. And that's really, for me, where the interesting movies are. And sometimes they do grow to become something very big. And we're also involved in that enterprise as well. But I don't think, for the time being, we can skip the big blockbusters. Those, those are here for a while. Thank you for your question. Um, can we please, sorry to make you run around, but right at the back on the edge there. Kind of following on from that question, I was just wondering more about how you decide with, say, books and comics and things, um, when that you actually want to buy the rights, when it's a worthwhile property for you to invest in, and like, say, with the case of Spider-Man, when you need to kind of cut your losses and move on. So, you know, I, 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 one, of the f what, one of the things that is going on at the moment is um, the fact that uh, and, and unfortunately, at, at some level, it can make movies a little bit less interesting, is the movie industry has now determined, correctly or incorrectly, that one of the safer ways to go is with properties that have pre-existing audiences. Um, some of those are comic book properties, some of those are big best-selling novels or novels that have sold a certain number of copies. And so I think um, we are inclined on many occasions to go after whether it's a big book or whether it's a comic book for that reason, because you know there's a certain audience there. It's, it has actually, in a funny way, 
oftentimes less to do with the source material, although that's important as well, than it has to do with the fact that there's that audience out there that you know that will already know the name of it, will know the characters, and they'll want to see it in, in a film version. Thank you for your question. Um, can we please go to the member there? I was wondering if you could comment on the distribution rights to the Bond franchise following on from Spectre, whether or not they will stay with Sony, and if that impacts when we might next see another Bond film. Uh, I, 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 we are, MGM and the Broccoli's jointly control at this point who will be the next distributor of the Bond movie. So we, dist we, we produced and distributed the last four with them. Um, and the rights are now available again. Um, obviously, we've had a really good partnership for the last 12 years, and the hope would be that we would continue. They're entering a process in the next, I don't know, two, three months to try and figure out whether <coughs> we will be their partner or perhaps another studio will be their partner. That's, that's for them to determine. We would obviously love to do it. Um, that goes without saying, but I'll say it. As far as when the next Bond movie is, is I don't know. Um, and I don't think they do either. I think part of it is um, when Daniel Craig is ready to make another Bond movie and, and, and uh, that, that's a component of it in addition. Thank you very much for your question. I'm afraid that is all we have time for this thank evening. Thank you very much. No, but, uh, Mike, thank you very much for coming. Um, if you could all please remain seated and, uh, as Mr. Linton leaves the library and join me once again in thanking Mr. Linton. Come and visit us this evening. Thanks a lot. <laughs>